Fiez, and for the past two years I've been involved in the National Poetry Recitation Contest called Poetry Out Loud, sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Poetry Foundation. And tonight I'll be reciting a poem written by Sharon Olds called Mrs. Krikorian. And it's Sharon Olds' way of honoring a wonderful teacher she must have had in sixth grade. And it seems that she wasn't very well behaved in sixth grade. And to be honest, neither was I. And the poem really spoke to me. And it was the first poem that piqued my interest in participating in the competition. So here it is. Mrs. Krikorian by Sharon Olds. She saved me. When I arrived in sixth grade, a known criminal, the new teacher asked me to stay after school the first day. She said, I've heard about you. She was a tall woman with a deep crevice between her breasts and a large, calm nose. She said, this is a special library pass. As soon as you finish your hour's work, that hour's work that took 10 minutes, and then the devil glanced into the room and found me empty, a house standing open. You can go to the library. Every hour, I'd zip through the work in a dash and slip out of my seat as if out of God's side and sail down to the library, solo through the empty, powerful halls, flash my pass, and stroll over to the dictionary to look up the most interesting word I knew, spank. <laughs> Dipping two fingers into the jar of library paste to suck that tart mucilage as I came to the page with the cocker spaniel silks curling up like the fine steam of the body. <sighs> After spank and breast, <laughs> I'd move on to Abe Lincoln and Helen Keller, safe in their goodness till the bell. Thanks to Mrs. Krikorian, amiable giantess with the kind eyes. When she asked me to write a play and direct it, and it was a flop, and I hid in the coat closet. She brought me a candy cane. As you lay a peppermint on the tongue, and the worm will come up out of the bowel to get it. And so I was emptied of Lucifer and filled with school glue and Eros and Amelia Earhart, saved by Mrs. Krikorian. And who had saved Mrs. Krikorian? When the Turks came across Armenia, who slid her into the belly of a quilt? Who locked her in a chest? Who mailed her to America? And that one who saved her, and that one who saved her, to save the one who saved Mrs. Krikorian, who was standing there, on the sill of sixth grade, a wide-hipped angel, smoky hair standing up weightless all around her head. I end up owing my soul to so many, to the Armenian nation. One more soul, someone jammed behind a stove, drove deep into a crack in a wall shoved under a bed. I would wake up in the morning under my bed, not knowing how I had got there, and lie in the dusk, the dust balls beside my face round and ashen, shining slightly with the eerie comfort of what is neither good nor evil. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, Billy Collins. Good evening. What a thrill and an honor it is to be here. And uh, how grateful we are to uh, the President and Mrs. Obama for hosting this, for drawing attention to poetry in America. Uh, I'm only sorry that so many of my fellow poets uh, could not be here to join us tonight. Well, not really. <laughs> uh, it's, um, it's important that I'm here. Um, one of my poet friends uh, phoned me earlier in the week and said, you know, you're going you're to make so many poets jealous going to the White House. And I said, well, isn't that the whole point of writing? I mean, <laughs> and then he reminded me that the point of writing was to marry truth and beauty. So hats off to him, but he's not, he's not, he's not here either. So. Well, I was told originally that I could read only one poem, but I pulled a former Poet Laureate privilege and I've extended it to two poems. So uh, it's customary toward the end of poetry readings to give what is called the two poem warning. <laughs> and, but I'm gonna start by giving you the two poem warning. So you've been warned. Um, the first poem is called Forgetfulness and it's a meditation on on forgetting, and it begins uh, with uh, something called literary amnesia, that is, forgetting uh, books you've read. Uh, forgetfulness. The name of the author is the first to go, followed obediently by the title, the plot, the heartbreaking conclusion, <laughs> the entire novel, which suddenly becomes one you have never read, never even heard of. It is as if, one by one, the memories you used to harbor decided to retire to the southern hemisphere of the brain, to a little fishing village where there are no phones. <laughs> Long ago, you kissed the names of the nine muses goodbye, and you watched the quadratic equation pack its bag. And even now, as you memorize the order of the planet, something else is slipping away, a state flower, perhaps, the address of an uncle, the capital of Paraguay. Whatever it is you are struggling to remember, it is not poised on the tip of your tongue, not even lurking in some obscure corner of your spleen. It has floated away down a dark mythological river whose name begins with an L, as far as you can recall. Well, on your own way to oblivion, where you will join those who have forgotten even how to swim and how to ride a bicycle. No wonder you rise in the middle of the night to look up the date of a famous battle in a book on war. No wonder the moon in the window seems to have drifted out of a love poem that you used to know by heart. <laughs> Thank you. And this is a poem about uh, something children do in the summertime at camp, and it's called The Lanyard. The other day as I was ricocheting slowly off the pale blue walls of this room, bouncing from typewriter to piano, from bookshelf to an envelope lying on the floor, I found myself in the L section of the dictionary where my eyes fell upon the word lanyard. No cookie nibbled by a French novelist could send one more suddenly into the past, a past where I sat at a workbench at a camp by a deep Adirondack lake, learning how to braid thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift for my mother. I had never seen anyone use a lanyard or wear one if that's what you did with them, but that did not keep me from crossing strand over strand again and again, until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. She gave me life and milk from her breasts, and I gave her a lanyard. <clears throat> <laughs> she nursed me in many a sick room, lifted teaspoons of medicine to my lips, set cold face cloths on my forehead, then led me out into the airy light 
and taught me to walk and swim. And I, in turn, presented her with a lanyard. <laughs> here are thousands of meals, she said, and here is clothing and a good education. <laughs> and here is your lanyard, I replied, <laughs> which I made with a little help from a counselor. <laughs> here is a breathing body and a beating heart, strong legs, bones, and teeth, and two clear eyes to read the world, she whispered. And here, I said, is the lanyard <laughs> I made at camp. And here, I wish to say to her now, is a smaller gift, not the archaic truth that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took the two-tone lanyard from my hands, I was as sure as a boy could be that this useless, worthless thing I wove out of boredom would be enough to make us even. Thank you.